This is Derek Jones. This is DJ Severe. This is J.R. Robinson. This is Mike C. This is Natalie Dunn. This is Jay Moore. This is Dexter from the Osprey. This is Nathan East. This is Eric E.Q. Young. This is Angelo Moore. This is Thomas McElroy. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. This is Gilson Labus, and you're listening to the Break It Down Show. And now, the Break It Down Show with John and Pete. Gilson Levis is a drummer of great renown who came to my attention and Pete's in his old band Squeeze. Prior to that, though, he had played and toured with the likes of Chuck Berry, Dolly Parton, and he has since rejoined his old band member from Squeeze, Jules Holland, in the Jules Holland Rhythm and Blues Orchestra. And I am uh, elated to have you on the show. Thank you for joining us. It's a privilege to be here. Well, we're going to talk about your uh, artistic endeavors as well, because you've also since become a portrait artist. Yes, I've been very fortunate. Yeah, something that sprung out of many, many, many nights sitting in hotel rooms. I started sketching uh, oh, many years ago now, and now it's moved into painting and sketching, and I've been privileged to have quite a few exhibitions, one in New York late last year. There's one in London opening up. Anyway, we'll talk about that. Okay. Well, let's start with your primary occupation, or the occupation for which most of us know you. What made you pick up the sticks? Well, when I was at school, way, way back when I was but a youth, uh, 13 years old, I was being encouraged to go forward with my art, but I thought there was a much better chance of getting on with the opposite sex if I was a musician. (laughs) So It's absolutely true, and I've got to say the driving force was sex, really. I'd, and um, a bit, a bit of a, a shy chap, I thought playing music might get me somewhere. It never did, I've got to say. It never did work. But the school band had about seven lead guitarists and no drummer. So the only way I could get into the school band, which was a sort of pop group as we, or a beat group, actually, going back that far, was to be the drummer. So I started <laughs> playing the drum more out of desperation than a burning desire. But it turned out they... I had a, a bit of a bent for, for that particular me, instrument, uh, and I've never stopped since. And that was, oh, God, that was nearly 50, 55 years ago or something. So, Well, I appreciate your candor. Yeah, We've had plenty of drummers on the show, and not one of them until you has been candid enough to say, well, I started playing so I could get some chicks. Why did you start playing? <laughs> because let's face it, that's really the answer, right? <laughs> Well, it was certainly the answer for me, my friend. I've got to say, it never really worked. It seemed like, um, uh, for many, many years, I've, I've been around the globe many times in, in various forms, uh, and all the girls in the dressing rooms, I'm an old man now, but all the girls in the dressing rooms seemed to levitate or move towards the lead guitarist or the vocalist, and I got stuck with the the, the chaps in, in anoraks who wanted to talk about bass drum pedals. But, um, <laughs> but that was but that was quite interesting thing in common. Wow. <laughs> I'm not sure what to think about those girls who drifted toward the guitarist. They didn't know what they were missing. Absolutely. That's what I'll say for us. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so how does a guy like you come across the pond and get a gig with someone like Chuck Berry? Well, it was the other way around, actually. Chuck Berry came across the pond and, and got a gig with me. All right. Um, well, I, you know, it, I was I was a drummer with Chuck quite a few for about three or four years. It was going way back in the days when the Musician Union and the American Musician Union, I think it's called the same thing, there was this quid per quo thing going on, which only so many American musicians could come over here and so many English musicians could go over there. And it was quite complicated. So what, what a lot of American artists, such as Tammy Wynette and Dolly Parton and, and all those people that I had the privilege of working with in those days, what they would do is they'd come over here with a couple of players. Well, actually, Chuck didn't bring anybody, but um, they'd come over here with a couple of players, maybe a, a an MD and a pianist or, or something like that and then they'd, they'd pick up British or English musicians to, to, to work with them in Europe and that's how I come to work with all these people so it was it was in and around Europe all over Great Britain and all over Europe that I that I worked with these wonderful people well that makes sense that they would show up and want to work through Europe with European musicians was probably cheaper at the time and as long as they brought their MD over there they had a musical basis from which to start, and, and then they'd just hook up with some professionals who could take it the rest of the way. 
That's right. That's how it worked. In fact, it, it wasn't like that with Chuck. Chuck had a different approach, which I shall, I shall come to. But he was brought over here by a promoter called Mervyn Conn. Now, Mervyn Conn also did a lot of big country uh, music festivals, which is where I got to work with these other great artists. The big Wembley, uh, Wembley's a big arena over here, and that, there used to be a, a big a Wembley country music festival. Anyway, uh, Mervyn, Mervyn Conn, he brought Chuck over to do, um, oh, for about three or four years, maybe longer. He, he would bring Chuck over every year to tour Europe. Anyway, the first time uh, I worked with Chuck, there was no rehearsals. What happened was uh, he said, um, Chuck has asked you musicians, us, me, and the rest of the musos, to listen to his greatest hits album, and then he'll see you at the gig. Well, in fact, we did uh, listen to his greatest hits album, and then we turned up at the gig, and I think it was Walthamstow Empire, or, or one of those sort of gigs in London. I can't remember where or when. It's so long ago. But we never did meet Chuck. We didn't see him even before the show. The first time I met Chuck Berry was when he walked out on stage in front of the band and in front of the audience. Never, ever met him before that. The show went great. <laughs> and after all, uh, most of us knew all those songs anyway. You know, Johnny Be Good and, and, and Sweet Little Sixteen and, uh, you know, all those stuff. Sure. So it was a privilege. But we never did, ever did rehearse with Chuck. Uh, I think he liked the chaos too. I could pick up and I sort of worked out where he was going with stuff and, and I started to sort of tie in and lock in with him. I knew he was going to the bridge now and then he'd be going into a guitar solo and I could sort of work out when this was going to happen. And he deliberately would lead me astray to keep, <laughs> to, to keep this sort of the whole chaotic, bumbling, sort of vibe, you know. So, yeah, he was a unique performer. Uh, God bless him, Chuck, you know. And the thing is, as well, John, I didn't realise, I mean, working with these un incredible people that changed the face of, of rock and roll, at the time I had no idea. I had no idea what a privileged position I was, I was in. I was just going to work and playing with these American artists, but I didn't know. Wow. I didn't know that I was that I was taking part in sort of, an, an historic event, you're just going to work and, you know, playing the drums, you know, so... Um, trying to get some chicks. Comes to, <laughs> yeah, still trying to get, get some chicks. Wow. <laughs> Very, yeah. And so yeah, God bless. let's go through some of the artists that you got to work with in those days, not only Chuck Berry, but I know I saw Dolly Parton, Jerry Lee Lewis. Who are some of the other uh, noteworthy artists who came over? Well, Tom, uh, Tammy Wynette came over, uh, and then I sat in with Bo Diddley when he came over, and, um, oh, I can't remember who else. Who else from America? Wow. Endless British artists, endless, endless British artists, you know. Um, but uh, I don't know if they mean anything to you, but, I mean, huge, huge British artists as well I was touring with. But um, that's all a bit of a grey swirling mass for me now, I've got to say. <laughs> and, you know, when... When you get to my age and you spend so so many evenings and long car journeys and aeroplane journeys recounting anecdote, truth and fantasy starts to merge. <laughs> you start to, did I really do that? Oh yes, I did. Or was that a made-up anecdote? You know, it all starts to get a bit hazy. But no, but but uh, no, they were wonderful times. But I was really young. That's the other thing. You, you have to remember, I was doing this when I was in my late teens. I was about 18 years old, 19, when I was doing this. And um, from that age, right the way through till I joined Squeeze at, um, I think I was 24 when I joined Squeeze, when Squeeze, well, it wasn't really up and running, when Squeeze started, really. And so that's the period I'm talking about, you know, and, uh, and that's a lifetime ago now, John, a lifetime ago, mate. Well, you know, it becomes gray and hazy when you've done a lot. If you'd only done two or three yeah, but, things, you'd remember them in great detail. So that's sort of why we're here. It yeah, it, sure. it blew me away, though, as I started to get to know your body of work, that by the time we had discovered you over here in Squeeze, you had already done all of those things. So you had to have gotten an early start and, and uh, been through that phase of your life where you didn't really have a sense of the gravity of the artists you were working with. So... Uh, that, that's terrific. How did that work uh, inform your 
work in Squeeze because it seems so much different to think about, you know, the early rock and roll artists and then to think about the the work that you guys did as a new wave band in Squeeze yeah, yeah. and and the similarities. Yeah, well, it, you say the thing is you've edited out a, a large bit there too because it wasn't just a uh, rock and roll artist I played with. Okay. I did a lot of touring with cabaret artists as well. You know, I was very used to blow drying my hair and wearing black male hair suits and, and dicky bows. <laughs> you know, I, and uh, acts that were playing the sort of chicken and chip, what well, we call it, the chicken and chips tour, you know, which is like you, you're, you're playing cabaret venues and uh, to seated audiences. And and so really I was a musical prostitute, John. I was I was just taking work wherever there was work. I was a freelance musician before the term freelance musician was sort of uh, used. I was just, and and uh, I think it's because I was keen, I was also pretty good, I think, in those days, uh, compared to a, a lot of drummers. I'm not saying I was brilliant, but I was I was pretty competent. I was getting quite a lot of work. Well, let's suppose you were getting the job done, <laughs> that's for sure. Um, uh so the move from that line of work into, you know, sort of being a job in drama, playing with anybody who had my phone number, really, into playing with Squeeze, that was a drastic change. Wow. Uh, and that came about, if, if you really do want the history, that came about through financial constraints. What happened was, uh, and this is quite a poignant story, I don't want to take up too much of your time here. I don't know how long we're going to chat. <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> All right. Well, what happened was I, I was working doing these tours, you know, with uh, Chuck Berry and various other people. This episode of The Break It Down Show is brought to you by Lions Rock Productions. That's us. We publish, evaluate, and develop podcasts just like this one, consult others to build their own, and create associated content and content marketing strategies. So if you're launching or expanding your social media presence, your business, or your personal brand, or if you just want to take your media presence to the next level, reach out to us on Twitter at Pete A. Turner or at John LG 69 at The Break It Down Show. There's a thousand ways to get a hold of us. Now enjoy the show. All right. Well, what happened was I, I was working, doing these tours, you know, with uh, Chuck Berry and various other people. And uh, and I've made a bit of money, you know, and I, I, learned, I learned some cash. And so along with some friends, I opened a music shop in Southend-on-Sea, which is down on the Essex coast, about uh, 20, 25 miles east of London. And I, and I was living down there at the time. And I opened a music shop with some friends, and it did okay. I mean, I've never been much of a businessman, you know. I, I, I'm not bad drummer. But you're also in your very early 20s at the time. Yeah, yeah, I was in I was in my early 20s, really. And it did okay, but then the government of the day was at loggerheads with the miners. They were going on strike because the government were closing a lot of pits. Uh, the coal pits became a, uh, had stopped being viable. They were closing a lot of pits. A lot of communities were being destroyed. And so they went on strike and the country was almost grinding to a standstill. And so the government, what they did was they brought in a three day week, which meant that the whole country was only working for three days a week. And the, the other days were like long weekends. And when that happened, of course, people were only getting paid for three days a week. So they couldn't afford to go and buy musical instruments, luxury items. So the shop went bust. Now, I've been pumping my money into this shop, and, and we'd run out of money. And so to finance and to keep the shop going, I put my own personal drum kit in the window of the shop. And it was during this period that the bailiffs came in and shut the shop down and seized all the stock. Oh, come on. No, it's true. And your kit was in the window. My kit was in the window. And so I lost my drum kit. No tours were being put together because it's three-day week. Nobody had any money. And so I had no work and no drum kit. So from being sort of quite well off and, and a bit too big for my boots, I'd gone down to being unemployed and having no drum kit. Oh, no. So I scurried back to go and live with my mother. My father had passed away a year before. God bless him. God bless him. Had passed away a year before, and my mother was living by herself in Bedford. So I scurried home to live with my mother at the age of 23, I think I was, or something like that. And I got a job working in a brick company, stacking bricks. So I wasn't even playing the drums. Uh, I was stacking bricks in, in, in the London Brick Company. And after about sort of 
two or three months of doing this, my hands were being welded into a claw-like shape. No. Oh. And I and I realised that if I was ever going to play the drums again, I'd better get out of this job. And so I, I went back one night and looked very, very sad and, and, and mournfully at my lovely mum. And uh, I said, I can't do this anymore, mum. I want to go back to playing the drums. And so she, she bought me a drum kit. And she actually paid for it out of my dad's insurance money from when he passed away. She bought me a drum kit. Wow. And that was a Ludwig Octoplus drum kit. So now I had a drum kit. And I had it set up in my mother's front room in Bedford, trying to play it with claw-like hands. And gradually, ever so gradually, my feelings and things came back and my chops came back a bit. And so then I thought, well, all right, I'm going to get back to playing the drums. So I bought a Melody Maker, which is a music mag over here. And I looked at the uh, adverts. And in the back of the, the Melody Maker, there was a tiny little ad. It wasn't even a box ad. It was a tiny little ad. It said, South London Band Looking for Drummer. So I said, here, yeah, I'll phone these up, Mum. What do you reckon? So I phoned them up, and they said, come down and have a go. So I took the front, I took the front seat out of my mother's Mini. I, I loaded my drum kit into my mum's Mini, and I drove down to Greenwich in South London and auditioned for a bunch of ne'er-do-wells uh, <laughs> in the, in the uh, room below a swimming bar. And uh, I got the job. I was I think I was the only bloke who could actually play the drums that turned up to the auditions. And I got the job. And, well, thank goodness. And that is how I came to get the job with Squeeze. That is terrific. I love that story. Yeah. It's a story that I think many of us drummers have to go through, and some don't make it out. And, and some have to live vicariously through the guys who have the guts to take the front seat out of their mom's <laughs> mini and go to an audition for a South London band that can't afford more than a few words in the back of Melody Maker. I know, it's strange, isn't it? But I will say this, getting back to the music industry, I've had some up and downs in my career. I'm a recovering alcoholic, you know. I've, I've, I've been through the mill a bit. Uh, and I, you know, I got sacked from Squeeze after about nine years, and then we reformed, and I got sacked again. Long old story, ups and downs. I mean, really huge ups and downs. You know, Madison Square Garden, and six months later, driving a minicab in South London. You know, just crazy ups and downs in the music business. But it doesn't matter what I did, apart from, you know, when I wasn't in the music business, whether I was driving a minicab, whether I was working as a labourer or working in a brickyard stacking bricks, if anybody had asked me what I did for a living, I would still say I was a drummer. All right. Do you see what I mean? It's that concept yep. of deciding. It never left your identity. It never left my identity. It didn't matter what I was doing, how I was paying the rent. I was still a drummer, you know, and I think that's that's the commitment that you're born with. I don't think it's something you can learn. I think it's just the way we are as musicians, you know. So. That is very, very beautiful. I think that uh, we all should learn something from this. But I do definitely want to fast forward a bit because I'm looking at a big stack of your portrait art, and your portrait art is absolutely fantastic. I'm looking at a beautiful black... You do black and white portraits. Yeah. Or more accurately, there's a, a whole lot of white on black. And and everything is the interplay of gray. And terrific portraits of, of folks like Eric Clapton, Louis Armstrong, Dionne Warwick. I mean, how do you, first of all, how do you, Bruce Springsteen, how do you decide who you want to uh, capture? Well, a lot of them are people that I've had the privilege of working with. You mentioned... Uh... Uh, Eric Clapton, I've worked with Eric many times, both recording and live. I've, and uh, Dionne Warwick, she came over and recorded with us, and I, I worked recording and, and and live and on TV with, with both of those. Uh, it, so a lot of them, a lot of these images, I did send a couple on Skype, actually. I don't know if you've seen them, but a, a lot of these images, uh, a lot of these people are, are people I've worked with, but they all are people that have inspired me. And so it really, it's sort of a musical, it's a, a painted biography of, of, of my career, really. You know, um, I did do a portrait of Squeeze, the whole band, but, but somebody made me an offer I couldn't refuse out in Japan when I posted it on Facebook, and so I had to sell it. <laughs> I couldn't say no. It was just such a ludicrous offer, you know. Um, so I sold that. But um, 
Yeah, I'll pay. Good for you. <laughs> oh, absolutely. You know, and, uh, and uh, again, back to selling stuff. You know, well, what I do for a living, I, thankfully, I'm still blessed, and I still work with the with Jules and the Rhythm of Blue, Blues Orchestra, and we're very successful over here. We play a lot of big shows. We play 80 to 90 live shows a year, and I do TV series and and radio series, and I'm I'm always working. You know, I'm always playing the drums still at this tender age of 67. I'm still working, but um, so that's that's where I earn my money, and that's where I, I you know I make a living, but. It removes me completely from the trials and tribulations of traveling, you know, and I love doing it. But the highest compliment everybody, anybody has ever paid me with my artwork is when they actually say, I want to buy that. Quite often, when there are exhibitions, you find people, and I've been to, I've had quite a few now, several exhibitions, you'll get people come up and they say, oh, I love that piece, oh, that looks really good, I love that, I love the way you play with light and the way you do this, so thank you very much. And they say all these lovely things and then they go home. But the people you know you can believe are the ones that actually put their hands in their pocket and say, I want to buy that. I'm going to hang that on my wall. That is the highest compliment that anybody can pay an artist. An artist in any form, but especially in the in the visual form, because these are one offs. I mean, I've loved your recorded works for as long as you've been making them. But those are easy to get to, and they cost a few bucks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but to make the commitment to say, I love this piece of art so much that I'm going to make it a part of the landscape of my life. Absolutely. I'm going to hang it in my home, and I'm going to shell out for this one-off piece. Yes. Means that, you know, I've owned pieces of art that you've played on along with a million other people. The folks who are buying your paintings are the only one. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. Yeah. You've hit the nail. Yeah, there, John. And it's, and it is quite a commitment. I mean, my paintings aren't cheap. I mean, I can't give them away or the list will be going right down the street. You know, the queue will be going down the street. But, um, but, you know, I, 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 I'm not exorbitant. I try not to take, take the mickey with it. But it, but it's still quite a commitment. You know, somebody to say that I like that enough to hang that on my wall and look at it every day. That's a big thing, you know, and I, and I, it sort of sends shivers down my spine, and I do I do mean down my spine and not down my wallet. You know, it is, it is it's a lovely thing. It's well, we're we're all entitled to make a living, and when you can put a piece of artwork in someone's home and someone's life that allows them to enjoy, you know, and be stimulated, then you deserve a few bucks. Well, thank you. Yeah, my, my wife would agree with you. <laughs> well that's terrific you know i'm not going to keep you too long i could i could do this all day but i'm not going to keep you too long i, I just want to make sure that we hit the salient points which are that you are playing uh, all the time with with the jules holland rhythm and blues orchestra and people can see you there and that you have your show of portrait artwork opening in london in july yes uh, do we have details that we can link on our website? Yeah, well, um, uh, yes, I've um, I've posted a, a couple of flyers for it on my Facebook page. Okay. Uh, you can you can follow it there, both on Gilson Labis Artworks and on my own Gilson Labis personal page. There are links to it there. Uh, also, I shall say it now: it's at the Karma Sanctum Soho Hotel, which is right in the centre of of London, there in Soho in London. Uh, and it's on the, it's, it opens on the 25th of July. I will be there for the opening. Unfortunately, I won't be there every night. It's on for six weeks, but I'll certainly be there for the opening. So if anybody fancies coming along, meeting me and seeing some of my artwork, it'd be lovely to see you. Terrific. Okay. Is there anything else that we, um, that we can promote on the show or are we missing any notes? Are we, uh, are you doing anything else the rest of this year that we should, that we should highlight or announce now? Well, no, I think we've covered it. You see, I'm I'm not really touting for work as a drummer. I've got a gig, mate. I don't I don't need the work, and I, you know, I only work with Jules really, and and that's that's enough because we get a lot of guest guest artists working with us, like like we've shared, you know, from Dr. John, Eric Clapton. They've all sort of come over and work with the Rhythm and Blues Orchestra, which is a real privilege. So no, not really. I mean, we've talked about the art, we've talked about the music, and I'm still getting away with it. You're still getting play- away with it. <laughs> I've got a plan. I'm going to keep going till I'm found out. Then I'm going to write a book. 
So, so that's my business plan, John. Excellent. That is a great plan. You know, for somebody who has stacked up the life experience that you have and given us all the great uh, art musically and artistically, uh, I I think that's a great plan. I know that I would be uh, first in line to buy the book, and uh, we would love to have you um, dissect it here first when it's time for you to go on that book tour. You know, we don't know many folks out there in London, but I know an audio engineer named Wes Maybe who's out there, and I know that he would love to meet you guys. So I hope that your paths cross at some point, but I'm going to make your path and his cross on uh, Facebook or something because uh, he's out there working for um, a lot of great artists. I think most recently Sting and, uh, yeah, he's he's one of those guys who he's a he's a younger guy. Uh, but he knows what's going on, and he appreciates the roots of what uh, what his living is in now in making people sound good. So, um, anyway, okay. yeah. I, I just want to say, Gilson, I, I, I've loved your work for many, many years. It's a privilege to have you on, and uh, any time that we can get you for, for a little while to talk about whatever it is you're doing, we'd love to do it. Thank you so much. The privilege is entirely mine, John. Thank you. Thank you very much. Take care, my friend. Enjoy life. Thank you. The only one we got. (laughs) You do the same as you've been doing for the past many years. Thanks so much. Gilson Levis, everybody. 